Right. Okay, guys, I think I'm happening tonight again. I'm just messing around with all sorts of technology over here. Uh, I don't know if it's working too well. I've got a, just a short clip to play, just to introduce our church online tonight. Kerry, can you just... Oh, no, I've got to do it. Let me find the stuff. Here we go. Change the view. Oh, that's better. Okay. Here we go. Okay, Kerry, are you going to kill that for me? Okay. All right, guys. Um, I don't think things are happening exactly how I'd like them to happen tonight. But um, it's all good. Okay, let me get myself organised. I'm very disorganised tonight, as you can tell. Just trying some different things. All right, so I am totally distracted. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for tuning in tonight. I hope you're all settled in for the evening. And uh, we're going to continue this great topic I've been preaching about on the, the book of Jonah. And I, I've got a little bit of stuff to go through tonight. And I'm believing it's going to be a blessing to us. And I've chosen to use my iPad tonight. I'm just thinking that the uh, video quality may be a little bit better. I don't know if it is. Please let me know if you think the quality is better or worse. Normally I use my iPad Mac. If you think this is quite a little bit better than the iMac, uh, let me know and we can uh, look at keep continuing to use uh, this medium on the Facebook and on the iPad. If not, we'll go back to the laptop as I normally do and use my iPad for preaching from. Anyway, uh, let me not rave on. Let me introduce the su subject. So tonight we're, we're going back to the, uh, the book of Jonah and we're going to start to just explore some more points of interest from this book. I've got my trusty Bible. Good to have a Bible. Good to know some of it. It's good. And um, I've got some notes to, to run out of for tonight. So if you remember last week, uh, we were looking at the book of Jonah. And um, we, we sort of called these sermons, um, well, this part of the sermons, called to serve. And um, through these series, it's broken up into different points and different topics. Okay, so we you'll get the gist of it as we continue to go. So, yes, last week we only got through two points. So we looked at the, uh, a little bit about Jonah, who he was, and the background of Jonah. And we looked at, the first point was called the call. And um, if you remember that from last week, sometimes I don't even remember what I've preached on last week. So if you don't remember that, I, look, I forgive you completely. Um, you can either re-watch it or forget about it and just, you know, watch tonight's. Uh, Jason, good day to see you, Jason. I'm watching people on here tonight on my iPad. Your names are coming up, so good on you. Great to see you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, the, yeah, but I haven't got that on here, Kerry. Anyway, so come on. Uh, so we did the call was the first point and we, we talked about. And then the second point uh, was the commission. So the call was, I was talking about how the word of the Lord came to Jonah, and we, we talked exclusively and extensively about that. And then we started to talk about the commission in verse 2, the commission where God comes and says, Arise and go. And we spent quite a bit of uh, time talking about arising and going and what that all means. And I want to continue tonight on, on this whole point of, of the commission. It's known to many people as the Great Commission, and many people preach uh, a lot about this on the Great Commission. And, you know, like, for me, it's a, just a, such a topic that strikes to my heart because of uh, my calling on my life is to missions. And uh, me and Carrie have both responded to the call of God on our lives over many years and developed 
a ministry um, in missions on that, and, and so we're passionate about uh, doing the Great Commission, fulfilling the Great Commission in our lives where we can, and obeying what God has called us to do. So really, it's like a soapbox topic for me in a way. But I also love the um, whole account of Jonah because he's so human. Uh, he goes through many tragedies. He has many mistakes. He makes many bad choices. And in fact, he makes extremely bad choices. And yet the grace and the mercy of God uh, continues to bring Jonah back into the, the plan and the purposes of God and put him back on the track of what he was supposed to be doing. He was the most reluctant missionary and he was probably the most... Uh, bad prophet in that sense that he, you know his success in this story was not brilliant except the final results were incredible and anyway we'll get to all that as we continue to move on through this series so i want to look at five aspects of the great commission which jesus gave to his church and um he didn't give it to a, a church denomination and he didn't give it to a church building or a cathedral uh, or anything else he gave it to the church which is the people we are the church. So, you know, so many people get confused, but we are the church. God didn't give the Great Commission to it, bricks and, uh, and mortar and stained glass windows. He gave it to people, his people, his family, his children, who could then carry out the Great Commission, what he wanted to take place on this earth. And so we're going to look at um, this com these commission and this aspect of the Great Commission. And um, this is God's call for every single believer. Now, sometimes people get a, you know, a bit of a stumbling block over this because it, it's sometimes not always easy to um, hear God and then actually do what God tells us to do. And, and you know, here's a typical case we're talking about tonight of Jonah hearing from God. Um, yes, he heard clearly from God, but he didn't really want to do what God had called him to do. He, he really was um, being a little bad boy, you know, and, and, and getting up to mischief. So... Yeah, as Christians, we also have the choice of, um, are we going to just live our life for ourselves? Or are we going to um, try to outlive the, the Great Commission? Because the Great Commission was not just given to the church. It was given to every single believer. Every person who is a Christian who puts their hands up and says, yeah, I want to follow Jesus with all of my heart. Well, the Great Commission is for you. And we'll, we'll look at some of these scriptures tonight. Um, that talk about the Great Commission. So let me just move this here. And that note's over here. Well, this is going to be exciting. Okay, and then I've got to find my Bible. Here we go. Oh, settle in, folks. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just jiggling all over the place here. Okay, we're going to look at Luke. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Here we go, Luke. Chapter 24. Luke chapter 24 and verses maybe 45. Okay. Oh, the typing is getting smaller and smaller on my Bible. Okay. Now, this is quite incredible. The, in my notes, it says these words. It says, um, those who receive and understand the gospel are to preach to all nations. Those believers who receive the Great Commission and understand the power of the gospel, when they receive and they understand, then it's their duty to actually respond and do what God's calling. Just as Jonah was heard from God and received a call from God, and then it was his he understood the call, he had the revelation and understanding, and then it was his obligation to actually fulfill what God had called him to do. And, and this is the same idea in the book of Luke. And let me read it to you. It says this. It says, Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. Now this is talking to the disciples, you know. He opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written, The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in the name, in his name, to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you, and what my father has promised, 
but stay in the city until you have been clothed with the power from on high. So what he's saying is he opened their minds to understand some truth that he was revealing to them that wouldn't be received by the, the natural mind of thinking, but a spiritual process of revelation was taking place. And he was talking about the suffering of Christ because they didn't understand uh, what was going to take place with him on the cross. But he said here that, um, that repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. So there was a, a sense that um, for us to start to fulfill the great commission that God's called us to do as Christians, then we have to have a, uh, receive an understanding uh, from the scriptures to have it clear in our minds so that we can start to fulfill what God has called us to do. We need to have open minds to spiritual principles and processes and understanding that God is spirit and speaks to us in so many different ways. And so it's important. It's important that um, we allow God to open our minds. Some people go, I can't find the will of God. I don't understand what I'm supposed to be doing in life. You know, I don't know the plans of God that he has for me. And so, you know, we, we have to come to a place where we start to seek God and start to cry out to God and say, God, will you open my eyes to see what you want me to see? And will you give me a spiritual awareness and an understanding of what you're telling me to do? Because it's a spiritual call. Living a Christian life is a spiritual life. And the, the things that we get from God are, are spiritual. And God has called us to all called all of us to start to outlive the Great Commission in our lives. Again, let me read another second um, scripture. It's John chapter 20. John chapter 20. I'm spending a couple of minutes on scriptures tonight. Hopefully that they'll, they'll be speaking to you. Okay, John chapter 20, 19 to 21. I'm going to put the light on. Oh, that's better. Oh, more light. There you go. That is more handsome when the light shines from this side. It's quite incredible. Okay, John 19 to 21. Oh, yes. I go to set the scene with these scriptures. Okay. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Well, you know, I just love this whole idea. Here, here are the disciples uh, basically hiding behind locked doors in fear because of maybe the Jews, the, the, the Pharisees and the scribes would actually grab them out and cart them off down the road and crucify them as well. And so there was a great deal of fear uh, came upon them because, you know, Jesus had been crucified and it was a difficult situation for them to go through. And they were still struggling with um, working it all out and understanding uh, what God was really trying to do and what Jesus was doing. But here they are in a scared, lack of faith situation, gathered together behind locked doors. They were making sure nobody got them. They locked the doors. And here Jesus appears to them straight through the locked doors, straight through the wall. Jesus stands in front of them and appears to them and he shows them his hands and his feet. And, you know, the disciples were overjoyed when they saw Jesus. They, uh, they were amazed because now they were seeing Jesus Christ resurrected uh, for the first time. He was not dead. He had the scars of crucifixion, but he was very much alive and he was communicating and standing with them. And I'm sure the presence of God was amazing in that place. It's just an incredible experience that was taking place. And so the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord, when they saw Jesus, they saw the person they loved uh, still here, alive and well. And then Jesus says to them, um, again Jesus says, peace be with you. See, he understood that right at this particular time, these uh, Christians, these uh, disciples of him, his followers, they were not at peace. They were much frightened and afraid and, and worried and upset and concerned about what was going to take place in the future. And their minds were confused and they, you know, the, the rug had been pulled out from under their feet when Jesus was uh, killed and crucified on the cross. Their whole world fell apart. Uh, and yet here now we see Jesus come into this situation 
and just speak. Peace be with you. Twice he says it, so it must have been important that he comes into the room uh, and as this room is filled with fear and, and it's filled with um, loss, dismay, disappointment, broken dreams, plans, uh, and Jesus comes in and goes, peace be with you, peace be with you. And he repeats it, so it must be important, peace be with you. And then he says, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Spirit. Isn't that incredible? As I am sent, as I, um, <laughs> where is it? Come on. As the Father has sent me, and I am sending you. You see, you know, they received a revelation of Jesus. So they before they talked about the scriptures being open to them so they understood. But this time, there's a sense that they have this incredible supernatural encounter with Jesus Christ in his resurrected body. An amazing, amazing uh, experience. And they were surely overjoyed and, and just tremendously pumped up. I mean, I know I would be if Jesus came and, and stood in front of me. I'd be like, wow, it's great, you know. Uh, they were really pumped up and they so they received a, a revelation or a vision um, and, and began to understand why he came he, and started to understand that he came to to bring uh, forgiveness to the people and he came and said you've seen me do the father's work uh, and now I want you to go and do it likewise you know just as God sent me to this planet earth to fulfill the ministry and the ministry that I've been doing over these years, and you've been with me in these times, sharing the times that we've had together. Now that you've seen what I've been doing because of what the Father called me to do, now I am, I'm going, but I'm going to send you out. I'm going to give you the commission. I'm going to give you the ability to go out and do likewise. Jesus always said that um, greater works would we do than he did, and, and he also gives us the power and ability to do those things. And in this scripture, it says here that after he tells them that um, to, be, go, to go out, you see, we've got to go out, we've got to get up and we've got to get moving. And Jesus says, go out and do it. But he said, receive the Holy Spirit. He gave them the power to do what they needed to do. He gave them the ability to perform uh, what he could do. Jesus could do miracles and so could the disciples because now they had the same power of the Holy Spirit uh, dwelling within them. And they had this revelation of the risen Christ. Let's have a look, another look at the scripture. It's still concerning this whole idea of this, this, the great commission uh, that God has called us all into. So let's go to look at Mark chapter 16. I have to go Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Matthew. Oh, I lost him. Oh, Mark. Mark, I'm looking for. I got carried away singing Sunday school songs. You guys think I'm crazy, don't you? I oh, know. I hope not too crazy, or else you won't watch me anymore, and I, I would be very unhappy. Okay, Math, Mark, chapter sixteen and verse fourteen to sixteen. Fourteen to eighteen. 14 to 18. Here we go. Got to find it. Struggling to see it. Here we go. Ah. <laughs> Small type. <laughs> Small type. Okay. Mark, chapter 16, verse 14. Later Jesus appeared to the eleven as they were eating. Again, he comes to visit the disciples after his resurrection. He comes to them while they were eating. He rebuked them for their lack of faith. And their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. You see, um, people have seen Jesus in his resurrected body and they'd come racing back and talk to the disciples and, and say, oh, we've seen Jesus. And they were going, hmm, don't think so. You know, I'm sure Thomas was going, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Um, but, you know, Jesus comes along and, and, he, and he, he talks to them and he starts to deal with their hearts. He starts to deal with their attitudes and he starts to deal with their hearts. You see, in the previous event, Jesus comes and speaks peace into their lives because they were so frightened. In this aspect, 
of Jesus appearing between, before the disciples was that he actually wanted to deal with their hard attitudes, their lack of faith and their, some of the attitudes that they had. Even after Jesus has been resurrected from the dead, he's still very much concerned about how his, his uh, disciples are going because you know, he's put so much into their lives. He wants to see it continuing. And you can just see the heart of Jesus as he wants to keep mentoring these people and he says to them, um, let me go back to it. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. He said to them, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on the sick and they will get well. And after he had spoken these words, Jesus went into the heavens. So some, these were some of the last words that he gave to his disciples. And because they're the last words of Christ, you can see that uh, he really wanted to input these last few gems into the heart of his disciples because it was up to the disciples to to take this message of the gospel and to fulfill the Great Commission and start to proclaim it from Jerusalem to, Ju to Judea to Samaritan and to all the ends of the earth. He was just completely reminding them about what the job was all about, uh, about fulfilling this commission. And he rebuked them. <laughs> you know, he rebuked them for the lack of faith. And, you know, a lot of us as Christians, we don't like getting rebuked. Now, I don't like getting rebuked. Not really. But I remember many years ago, I was talking to a pastor. and I was having some counselling, I suppose, and a bit of a chat with this pastor. And I said to, to him, Pastor, I want you to tell me straight what the situation. When you give me counsel, I want you to be straight with me. I want you to be, if you have to be, honestly blunt with me because I don't want people just patting me on the head and giving me weird answers that make me feel better. I want to deal with some situations in my life and say, so just give it to me straight. It might hurt me, but it will do me good. And, and if it hurts me too much, then help me through it. You know, just be patient with me as I, as I take the challenge. But um, give, me, give it to me straight. Give me, if you need to rebuke me, rebuke me. You know, just don't give me fairy tales. And he went, wow. He said, not many people come to my office and say that, you know, to just be straight to the truth. But I'm a, I'm a person that I, I want people to be straight with me and I like to be straight with others. And Jesus was no exception. Jesus, he came and he rebuked the disciples. Why did he rebuke them? Because he wanted them to be in a better place. He didn't rebuke them because, he, you know, he wanted to punish them or just plain angry with them. He wanted them to be in a better place. He wanted them to be in a place um, not lacking faith, because you see, the reason that the whole issue of rebuke was because they, they lacked faith and they have a, had a stubbornness to believe what other people had seen. So lack of faith and stubbornness, you know, they're pretty major things for the disciples to have in their lives when they are the people that are going to be the key people in, in building the church of Jesus Christ in all nations. And so um, and I'm sure all of us sometimes have a, a bit of lack of faith. I'm sure all of us at times have a bit of stubbornness. I know I'm pretty stubborn at times. Uh, very, yes. I don't know. I may be better as I get older. I don't know. Uh, Kerry's laughing hysterically in the background. Um, but, you know, he comes and he just deals with the issues because he wants them to be prepared for, for the duty or the call or the commission that he's put upon them. And he repeats again. He says, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. And then he goes on to talk about the power that they will preach it with, the authority of Christ to be able to cast out demons and, and raise the dead and heal the sick and, and all those things. You know, when God calls us to do something, when God commissions us to do something, he always empowers us to fulfill what he's commissioned us to do. And, you know, me and Kerry, we can testify and testify and testify how what God has called us to do, uh, he has enabled us to do. Whether it's physically, mentally, spiritually, you know, uh, financially, whatever. What God has called us to do, God has enabled us to do it with success. And we are not any super people. We're not super spiritual, not super talented. 
you know, I can't sing, uh, I can't read very well, and I can't speak very well. So, I mean, you know, there's not a lot of talent going there. Nevertheless, God has called us on a journey uh, to go out and take the Great Commission to the world, our world, and the, and the world he's called us to. I mean, let's, let's keep it sort of fairly simple. Uh, God doesn't want you to go to every person in the whole world. It's an impossible task for you to go and talk to every single person. But God has people in your world and in other nations that he knows that you can speak to. And so we have to just fulfill what God has called us to do in the areas that God has called us into. And so, you know, we can't save the whole world, but we can make a difference with our, our, our friends, our neighbours, our family, those around us in our communities, beyond our communities. We can, we can make a difference in other people's lives if we're willing to go out and be people bringing good news. And in today's society, we need to be, uh, have good news and we need to be people who are willing to stand up and say, hey, I've got some good news. Because too many people saying there's a lot of bad news out there. Okay, so Jesus in this part of the Great Commission, he actually deals with their hearts and deals with their heart attitudes. Oh, hello, Lisa. I'm getting a few names coming up on my screen tonight, which is different to my laptop. Okay, what else? Oh, Jesus commanded them uh, that to go to all of, the, all of creation with the gospel. And because when he died, Jesus died on the cross to, to take away the curse that had come upon the whole world. And, and now he was saying to the, these disciples, go out and reverse the curse. Go out and reverse the curse because I've died for it and I've paid the price for it. Now go and reverse the curse and I'm going to give you all the power and all the authority to do that and fulfill that commission that I've put into your lives and I'm speaking into your hearts right now. So that's interesting. Okay, let's look at another scripture. Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, 16 to 20. Good, oh, this, is, this is in my Bible. I don't know about your Bible. Um, it's, it's subtitled The Great Commission. The Great Commission. And, you know, we are uh, as church people as uh, ministers of the gospel and particularly for me and Kerry as, as missionaries uh, the commission the great commission it's like wow come on it's so good okay let's have a look what it says here reading from verse 16 then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go and when they saw him they worshipped him but some doubted so there's, there's still that human element, isn't there? You know, they weren't all super spiritual, weren't all faith-filled. Uh, there were some people that still doubted. And, you know, I like that because this isn't a fairy tale. This is real life, real people, real situations. And all of us are going to have faith at some times and doubts at other times. But God wants to use all of us, regardless of where we are, have faith or no faith. God still wants to use us and, and bless us. And he wants us to be part of this great commission. So here we go. So he, he says this, okay. When they, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And that's pretty true because they've just seen him resurrected from the dead. That's pretty powerful. That's a powerful thing. But he goes on to say this. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. What an amazing thing. Therefore, go and make disciples. You know, we've all been called to go into our world and we've all been given the authority of Jesus Christ. And, you know, here it says some doubted. And some in that group were doubting. But the same compelling uh, urging of Jesus was the same to the doubter or those filled with faith. The same message was going into their hearts. You know, I have all authority, Jesus says, over heaven and earth. 
It's been given to me. And basically says, now I'm going to give it to you guys. Go and make disciples. Go out and baptize and preach and get people saved. And do all that I've commanded you to do. And he says, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus gave us an everlasting promise that he never sends us out on a mission and abandons us. No, no matter what he calls us to do, uh, he empowers us to do, but then he's with us all the way. We never walk away and he's hiding somewhere else and leaving us on our own. He's with us every step of the journey to help us to do all the things he's called us to do to, to fulfilling this great commission. Okay, another scripture. I think the last scripture here. Okay, Luke chapter 10. Here we go, Matthew, Mark, Luke again. Luke chapter 10 and verses 1 to 3. Okay. Oh, yes, I can see that. Okay, just got to get where I want to go to. After the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go, he told them, The harvest is plentiful. But the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I'm sending you out like lambs among the wolves. Do not take a purse or a bag or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. And he continues on to give them some advice on how to travel and what to do. But he says here, The labourers... The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And you know, as we start to understand the Great Commission and what God's called, calling us to do, it's an enormous task. God says, uh, go to the ends of the earth and preach the gospel to all nations, to every tribe and every tongue and every ethnic group and every place in earth go to the very ends of the earth and we and we start to go wow what an enormous job what a what such a big job how is it possible how is it possible for little old me to make any impact into this commission that God has called us into how can I be a world changer what can I do to change my world the the world is such a big place and even today with uh, internet electronics and air travel that's not happening at the moment but you know before that we could access the ends of the earth and the ends of the earth i tell you today are being impacted by the gospel praise god and and we are on on task we've still got a lot to do but we get we, we're doing quite good not good to get comfortable but we're being we're not being slack and, and our efforts are not going unrewarded the, the gospel is going out and i'm excited because one day it will come to an end because every person will have heard and, and it had a choice to follow Jesus or not. And after that, Jesus comes back. And, and I'm waiting for that day quite a lot, more and more every day. But here's the important thing about this scripture here. It says here that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And, you know, if we start to look at the enorm enormity of the task ahead of us, to go into all the world and preach the gospel, we can start to get overwhelmed. And we will be overwhelmed if we don't realise there's, there's a key thing here. There's a couple of key things here, actually. So, first of all, we are to ask the Lord of the harvest. If we are, if we are going to be commissioned by God to go out and, and, and preach the word of God to people, we've got to understand that our source of strength and our source of courage and, and, and we need to keep going back to the Father. God the Father. I need some help here, Lord. This job, this task you've given me is overwhelming and I just need you to help me. I need you to be there. I need you to be part of it. So it says here that, that he is the Lord of the harvest. He's the master of the harvest. The harvest is out there. It's plentiful. And God is the master of the harvest. And so, you know, if we're struggling... To work this out, then we need to go to the person who's in charge. Go to the boss of the harvest. If we're having trouble with the harvest, don't just complain about the harvest. Go to the manager of the harvest and, and see what he has to say, you know, and get the job done. It says here also, it says here, it says, um, 
asked the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. We're to ask for help. Do you, do you get that? Yeah. We're, we're not supposed to do this thing by ourselves. God didn't commission just Tom and Kerry to go into all of the world and preach the gospel, and that's it. That's all that's, all that's going to happen. It's just Tom and Kerry. Well, what a burden. Well, what pressure. What an enormous task that could not be completed by one man in many lifetimes. But God doesn't want us to do that. God wants us to actually raise up other people, ask God to give workers, to give us workers, to give us more workers for the harvest. And the more the harvest gets greater, our cry should be to God, God, give us more workers so we don't miss or waste or lose the harvest that's coming to us, that, that people will start to get excited about their part that they can play in the harvest. And I want to tell you, I believe it with all of my heart and will continue till the day I die, there is a great harvest coming that we've never seen before. Even the facts that are, I've been hearing today about how many millions of people are becoming saved, it's amazing. We just had Carl Butler in our church this morning, a great evangelist, and he's talking about how many million people are being converted. And it's wonderful. It's incredible. And I believe with all of my heart, we are going to see the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit on this planet Earth that we've ever seen before. And we're going to see the greatest harvest, the greatest revival of people returning to God like we've never seen. I'm believing it with all of my heart. I'm praying for it with all of my heart and the passion of my heart, praying to God that just release this, release the harvest, release it, let us, and let us be workers, you know. Don't just pray for harvest and for souls saved without being a person who's willing to be part of the harvesting. You know, the mangoes aren't just going to fall off the tree and land on your dining table. You've got to be willing to go out and harvest and pick them and bring them in and look after them and put them in your basket. And we need to be Christians who pray for the harvest and believe for a, a great harvest. We're not going down and under and small and quiet. We're getting bigger and better and stronger, more, more vi vibrant and powerful and excited for Jesus because the church is going to arise like we've never seen before. And we're going to see in this time of history a powerful, wonderful church that is going to influence many nations around the world. And many people are going to come to Jesus. That's what I'm believing for. That's what I'm looking for. That's what I'm holding on to. And that's what I believe. I believe we are ahead of us are the best times. Not the worst of times, the best of times. And I'm believing that with all of my heart. But we need to be people that take a responsibility to be part of the workforce. Be part of the workforce. Don't just pray for the harvest and sit in your little chair going hallelujah. Be out there. Be part of the harvesters. Be part of the workers. Find some ripe apples to go and pick. Find someone that's ready to receive Christ and bring them into the kingdom of God. Go out and if you can't do it by yourself, find a friend. If you're too scared to go and witness to somebody, grab a maid and go with you. You know, if the, if the harvest is overwhelming and it's abundant, then grab other people. Carl Buckner was saying how, um, you know, he, he goes overseas to these great, great meetings that he has as an evangelist. And there's just too many people to pray for, too many people who want to receive Christ. And it's impossible, he says, at times it's two hours or more praying for people. And he says it's impossible for him to do by himself. And so he enlists teams from the local church and he brings teams out from Australia. And he brings people who are willing to be workers in the harvest. And we're not called to do this alone. We're not called to do this incredible task alone. We're not called to convert the whole world by ourselves. We are called to work together. Build up a network of friends. Be willing to help other people pray to God to give us more workers. Well, wow, that was a bit of a, a mouthful then, wasn't it? And um, you know, I told you I, I get very excited about the Great Commission. And you think... Yeah, but what's this got to do with the book of Jonah? You know, you just taking me from all these New Testament uh, scriptures tonight, and you talked about Jesus uh, speaking to the disciples about the Great Commission. You know, how's that got to do with Jonah? Well, if I go back to my notes, um, Jonah was commissioned. I don't know, not flicking on Whoa. But Jonah was commissioned in, in, in the very second verse of Jonah. God said to him, Arise and go. Arise and go. That was his commission. He'd been called. He had the call of God. He understood what God was telling him what to do. 
and God gave him the commission. This is the Old Testament version of the New Testament commission. Uh, uh, God was very short of words in the Old Testament. He just said, arise and go. Jesus had a bit more to say about the Great Commission and gave us a bit more how to arise and how to go and, um, and added to that idea so we can have a greater understanding. So, you know, Jonah was commissioned not to go to all the nations, but he was commissioned to go out to Nineveh and um, bring a message to those people in Nineveh. We're commissioned to go to all of the world. <laughs> but we can't go... We can't go to all of the world. But what part of the world does God want you to go to? See, that's the question. That's the question. Uh, and we need to be asking God, well, how do I fit into this, God? How does this commission that you gave to the disciples and you gave to your church, how, how does that fit into my life? How do I work this out into my life? You know, I have a house, I have a job, and I have mortgages and bills or whatever. I have all these things. How do I put these principles into my life? How do they work for me? Well, first of all, we need to realize that this commission, it, it wasn't... Um, let me see how I can say this nicely. <laughs> this commission, it wasn't the suggestion... Jesus didn't come and say, look, mate, guys, disciples, you know, your buddies are mine. Uh, I'm going. I'm chuffing off to heaven soon. Uh, I've got some work that I haven't quite finished yet. I seem to be called away before I was kind of wanting to. And I've got some stuff that needs tidying up and loose ends fixing up. And I'm just suggesting maybe, you know, you'd like to just give it a bit of a go and try and do some stuff that I didn't do, you know, like finish off where I started. See, Jesus didn't talk to the disciples like that. Jesus didn't make a suggestion that, oh, maybe you'd like to do this. He actually gave them a command. He commanded them. He commanded them to go. To go. Go on, he says, go. You know? And you know, these Jews, uh, they were terrified. Uh, the whole world had fallen apart, as I said before, and they were locked into their understanding of just being uh, local and they thought the gospel was only for the Jews, and it was quite a process of, of the um, uh, disciples and apostles to start to understand that uh, not only was the gospel for the Jews, it was also for the Gentiles. And after they got the idea that it was for the Gentiles, it actually, the, the bigger picture started to develop, that Jesus actually wanted all people, all tribes and all nations, all ethnic groups, all colours, all cultures, to start to, to know the good news of the gospel, that Jesus came to die for our sins so we could be forgiven, so we could come back into right relationship with God. And that's what Jesus wanted these disciples to do. So how do we? How do we? How do we? How do we fill the Great Commission? Look, I'm not an evangelist. I'll be truth, 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 truth. I, I get a bit scared about talking to people sometimes, believe it or not. I'm not one to race down the road and grab a person in the shopping centre and shake demons out of them. You know, I, I'm a little bit, you know... Shy, I guess. So, so how do all of us do it? I mean, some of you are just rearing out there evangelists and you can't stop you. It's wonderful. God bless your gifting, you know. But for every other person who's not an evangelist, how do we fill the Great Commission? We, we can't possibly travel to all the ends of the earth to speak to every nation. And even if we could, we'd be too scared. <laughs> I mean, I could travel to the ends of the earth and get to there and get to a place I wouldn't have to speak the language and I wouldn't know what to say or anything. So how do we do this? How do we fulfill this commission that, that God's called us to do? How do we do it? And sometimes I don't know how we do it. <laughs> sometimes I don't know how do we. Well, we do some of the things I've talked about tonight. We need to have that um, understanding of the scriptures a scriptural revelation, the word of God speaking into our hearts to make it clear how we actually fulfill this commission. You see, God's a personal God and God's about our personal lives. And God has a plan for us individually and couples and families. God has a plan for us. And really, it, it's a discovery thing for us to discover what it is. And so that we need to have that spiritual understanding of the scriptures. There needs to be a revelation of the scriptures concerning God's will for our lives. We need to have a, a revelation, a vision of Christ himself 
and what God wants for our lives. We need to have a spiritual encounter with God where God starts to put his heart and his dreams and his plans, he starts to put them into our spirit. Now, I can't understand all these things, and I can't even explain all these things, and sometimes it sounds a little bit mystical. Now, I'm not a real crazy mystical hindu you know, hippie sort of dude. I'm not like that. But there is an element in the Christian life that is kind of mystical. God speaks to us in a spiritual language, in a spiritual way, and he doesn't speak into our intellect or our natural mind. But God he, he brings vision into our hearts and he puts desires into our hearts that they come from him. And I don't know how he gets them in there, but they get in. You see, God called me and Kerry. God, God called us. We know we can follow the steps through our lives where God truly called us into missions. And God actually told us where to go to. How did he do that? How did, did, did he say, Tom, you are to go to Ukraine? You know, he never did that. But, you know, as we tr serve God and we look for ways to serve him, the revelation of where he wanted us to be, step after step, year after year, solidified it into something that was a true plan of his. And, and we ended up going to, to Russia. And God told us through a prophet that he would give us a people group and he would give us people that we would love and they would love us. And, and we were looking to go all over any place in the world because we heard the Great Commission. We wanted to fill the Great Commission. We wanted to serve God with all of our hearts. And we go, God will go to China. We'll go to Japan. We'll go to Hong Kong. We'll go to Vietnam. We don't care where we go. We just want to fulfill your commission to go out and, and be missionaries and to you know, get into the groups of people and, and show them Jesus' love and work with them. Do whatever we need to do, whatever you want us to do. And... You know, we didn't know exactly which place it was. But by moving forward and by the directions of our life and opportunities that came, we eventually got into Russia for the first time. And, um, you know, we went to a place and the people loved us. We went to a place and we loved them. And, you know, uh, wow, what a confirmation that you are fulfilling what God's purpose is for your life. You know, some people just want these incredible, you know, prophets or revelation and supernatural things happening to confirm things. But I tell you what, God confirms his way in our lives in so many different ways. Different, and it doesn't happen instantaneously. It's a journey that might take many years. But I want to tell you, it's just an amazing thing. An amazing thing. We, me and Kerry, are absolutely convinced of the call of God upon our lives. And we're actually absolutely convinced that God has sent us to the nations. But we're also absolutely convinced even more at, even from today, even today, a fresh revelation to my heart today in church. But we are even convinced even more that our place is not all the nations. We can't go to all the nations. I said it's impossible. So we pray for other missionaries. God sent other people to those places, you know. But God has sent us to a place. And that place right at this moment is into Ukraine. And we've poured our hearts into Ukraine for many, many, many years now. And we have a wonderful ministry in Ukraine and a, a wonderful um, home base in Ukraine. A beautiful people that we love so much. And, you know, even today, my heart is aching for Ukraine because God has put a love in my heart for that country. And God enables us to go and, and gives us the ability to do what he calls us to do and empowers us to, to do what he's asked us to do. But, wow, I'm just overwhelmed by, by God's heart because God put this into my heart. It wasn't a thing that uh, we tried to make happen. We didn't manufacture it. Me and Kerry didn't sit there going, how can we love these people and how can we work this out and how can we work? We just simply started doing what we felt we should do. And, you know, part of that, Working out what to do is to go. The Bible didn't say sit and work it out. It said go. And, you know, sometimes you just got to get going. And I'm sure I said this last week and I'm repeating myself. But, you know, part of the fulfilling of the Great Commission is we need to be people of action. Jonah uh, waited and heard the Lord and the Lord came and spoke to him and he gave him a clear understanding of what he needed to do. And then he said, come on, go. Get out there and go. And, and so we need to be people willing to go. Well, I, I'm nearly off my sermon completely, but we, we're sort of hinting at the edges of it. And I, I just want to tell you that, you know, really, for us as Christians, our life is not just about having a good time for ourselves. It's more than that. Yes, we will have a good time. I'll tell you what, I'm more blessed 
in my life than ever I ever have been. I'm more, uh, I don't know, satisfied because I, I'm a visionary and I'm always looking so far ahead and expecting so many more things. But I'm in a good place. I'm in a good place, a, a better place than I've been in all my life, really. You know, we've got a nice home, we've got a little bit of money, we've got a few nice things around, I've got a nice motorbike parked in my garage, you know. I, I've got some stuff and material things and I'm blessed. My health is a bit dodgy, but it's still pretty good. You know, there's, I'm blessed, I'm in a good place. But it's not about, Christianity is not about just bless me, Lord, so I can have a good time. Christianity is about fulfilling the Great Commission. Fulfilling the Great Commission. That's what true Christianity is. That's what a true believer does. That's what a disciple of Jesus, a follower of Jesus does. He fulfills the Great Commission. Jesus didn't give it as a choice. There was not an optional box to tick. There was not multiple questions and you, you tick off what you like. Jesus, uh, as God came to Jonah, Jesus comes to us and he says, Arise and go. And we've got to start going and you might not know where you're going to go, but sometimes you have to make a, a step of faith and you have to start moving in a direction. And as you move in a direction, the Lord has a miraculous way of steering you into his paths and the way he wants you to go. Okay, Jonah, um, was. we often talk about that Jonah was you know, trying to escape from God, you know, because you know, you know, if you've read your Bible a few times or you've been to Sunday school, you know that when actually God told Jonah to go to Nineveh, we all know that Jonah actually didn't go to Nineveh, did he? Who knows that? Yep. Yeah. Went the opposite way. He didn't. He went the opposite way. Oh, it makes me laugh so much. It's just like us, isn't it? God sometimes deals with us in our life and has dealings in our life, and we might be going through some hard times because God is actually trying to get something through to us. Sometimes when life's a bit of a mess, God is trying to tell us something. And sometimes we're so involved in the mess, we're not hearing what God is trying to say. And sometimes God uses many situations, good and bad, to lead us and guide us into fulfilling his great commission and the call of God on our lives and his plan and purpose for us. But, you know, Jonah was um, maybe trying to get away from God. Maybe trying to get away. I've tried to get away from God and it doesn't work. If you're in a place where you're trying to get away or trying to keep your distance away from God, it doesn't work. And I tell you what, if you want, if you want just that release of joy and happiness and, and satisfaction in your life, you need to stop resisting God and you need to start running towards him. Uh, don't run away from him like Jonah did. Learn Jonah's lesson. Don't run from God. If you're just sitting, don't sit. <laughs> don't be a sitter. Be a get-up and doer. Anyway, sometimes people say that... that Jonah was trying to get away from God. But, you know, really, I think even Jonah knew that was impossible. Look, Jonah was a prophet. <laughs> so he was one of those special men in the Old Testament. Not everybody was a prophet like today. <laughs> everybody's a prophet today, I've found. Get on the internet and onto YouTube and everybody's a prophet. But in the Old Testament, there were only so many selected prophets. And um, if you prophesied the wrong thing, you were stoned. So... I don't think people stepped up for prophetic ministry too quickly like today. Many people want the prophetic. But anyway, Jonah was not, uh, he was not a person that didn't know God and know about God. He had, a, he had a good relationship with God and God spoke to him. He was God's messenger. He was God's prophet, trumpet, uh, pronouncer of good and bad things that God would reveal to him to speak to the people of Israel. And, and, and I believe with all of my heart that even though Jonah deliberately went in the opposite direction to what he should be going, I don't believe he was really trying to get away from God. Because I'm sure he would have known you it's impossible. I'm sure if you're a, Christ, if you're a Christian, if you're a backslidden Christian, if you're a Christian who, who is not connected to God for many years... I want to tell you, you know, don't you? You know it's impossible to get away from God. It, it, even in my life, maybe Kerry's life and, and, and Wendy. Wendy's life, maybe. Maybe there's been times when you, you think you can escape God. Maybe there's times you hope or wish with all of your heart you could escape God. But, you know, it's not possible. And, and, and I don't think Jonah was trying to escape God. I don't think Jonah was trying to escape God. What Jonah was trying to escape was the word of God. Now, listen, just listen. Listen to this. See, God came to Jonah and said, Jonah, 
Arise and go to Nineveh. That was God's word. And he was given the plan and what to say. He knew, he understood, he had a good revelation of his job and what he needed to do. So there was no doubt in his mind. But Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. That's the bottom line. Jonah did not want to go there. He was fearful. He didn't like them. They were his enemies. There were many, many cultural things that were going on in Jonah's mind and heart. But he absolutely did not want to go to Nineveh. He also recognised that the Ninevites were very fierce, horrible, mean, miserable people, and he didn't want God to spare them. Isn't that interesting? One of the reasons he didn't go to Nineveh and ran the opposite way was because he really didn't want God to forgive them. He wanted them to burn in hell. That's an amazing, uh, amazing thing, and what a crazy attitude for a, a prophet of God to have. But, you know, he was really just trying to escape from the duty, from the message that he was called to preach. And this is why he tried to run away. He didn't try to run away from God. He tried to run away from the responsibility of delivering the message that God had told him to deliver. And I'm going to finish right here. Now, God has commissioned all of us as believers, as the church, to go to go to all of the world and preach the gospel. That's one of the purposes and plans that God has. One of them, there's many, but there's one that's a big one God has for us as Christians. Now we've heard the word tonight. You have heard tonight, go into all the world. It was a command. It wasn't optional. Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples. Now you've heard me tonight. Not that I'm anybody special because I'm hearing it in my ear as well. But you've heard tonight that you've been told by Jesus to go into all of the world, or at least go into your world, go into your area of influence, go into your area of responsibility and be a person who can preach the word of God. The question is tonight, are you going to obey that? Or are you going to get frightened about it? Because when God calls us to do things, sometimes the things he calls us to do are scary. When God called Kerry to go to Russia, it was scary for her. It wasn't an easy thing. And, and she will testify about that. And I think she did in her little testimony, and which is going to become a book eventually, Hallelujah, one day. She's going to have a book published. And um, it wasn't easy for her to go. In fact, it was easier for her to, to stay at home and forget about the going part. But, you know, in her heart, she knew that she'd heard the message and she needed to respond and go. And I'm saying tonight to you tonight, you know, when God comes to us and asks us to do something, uh, sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes it goes against our fleshly desires and the things that we want. It goes against our plans and, and our dreams and our ideas of how we want to live our life. Sometimes God's word comes abruptly and strongly and it's like, Whoa, I'm not ready for that. You know, I'm, you look through the Old Testament at, at, at some of the situations that happen where people weren't allowed to bury their family, but they just had to go. You know, God seems to be unreasonable at times. And, and, but who are we to debate with God whether he's correct or not correct? When God calls us, we need to obey. And yet sometimes uh, if it's not so pleasant, we don't want to do it. And I think of all the missionaries that heard the call of God. And, you know, the early missionaries to going to Africa where they took their coffins with them because they knew they'd never come back. They knew that that's where they would die and maybe didn't live very long under the situations over there. See, there is a great responsibility when we have the revelation and understanding. There's a great responsibility when God speaks into our lives. There's a great responsibility that we then have to put into action. And, you know... As we look through this story of Jonah, we will we'll discover what he did and what went well and what didn't go well. But what, what has God called you to do? What is the message he wants you to speak? You see, we, we've all got different giftings. We've all got different personalities. God has got different people for us to mix with. God has got us. Uh, us we will speak to people in different ways. We're not all going to be standing on the street corner preaching. We're not all, all going to be rushing down the road uh, handing out tracts to everybody because you get arrested in Queensland right now. But there are people 
that God wants you to speak to. And there is a message that God has given you. It's your own personal message of your own testimony and your, your own belief in God and your own life journey. You have a testimony. And God wants you to speak it. Will you rise up and go to your Nineveh? <laughs> Will you take the courage to rise up and face some of the obstacles and the fears and uh, the excuses that we give God sometimes? We've all done it. I've done it. I'm sure you have. We've all done it. God, it was the wrong time. It's not convenient. Too difficult. I'm not able. Can't speak. Uneducated. I'm all of those things. But I was willing to go and give it a go. The place where God is calling you to, where is it? You need to find it and you need to arise and take up this great commission. Oh, I'm going to stop because I could just keep going. Stop, stop, stop. And I'm going to keep going next week on this incredible journey of Jonah, the prophet of God who has been called to go to this place of Nineveh and preach um, about this city's sin and see the repentance of this city. It's an amazing story. I love it. I love it. I love it. And we will get there. Eventually we will get right through to the end. But I trust it's been a blessing to you tonight. I, listen, I hope I've challenged you. Because I'm not a preacher that wants to tickle people's ears. Maybe that's why I don't have success sometimes. But I'm not a person that likes just to, you know, just be all lovey and dovey and say nice things. I, I, if you're uncomfortable tonight, I don't mind. Because I want the Holy Spirit to speak into your heart speak into your life and touch your life in such a powerful way that you start to live out your full, full potential for God and you take up the great commission with all of your heart and all of your energy and you fulfill what God has called you to do. And so I, I'm not frightened if you get a bit uncomfortable. I am frightened if you don't watch next week because I want you to, to watch the whole series. So please don't run away from my preaching. Like don't be a Jonah here. Yeah. Don't run away from my bad uh, stumbling words and preaching but come back next week and we'll continue god bless you all bye <laughs>